Let's see, something useful. We are in Romans chapter 7, which means it's time to pick up where we left off because, again, there's never any good where to leave off in this book. You're always having to pick back up somewhere. So we are picking back up with you being dead to sin and alive to Christ. You were a slave to sin. Now you are a slave to Christ. And so with that in mind, you can move forward with the knowledge of that reality. Now, here's where it gets fun. That knowledge, that reality of who you were and who you are, should actually have bearing on your life. Because, wait for it, reality should have bearing on your life, correct? Like, you don't get to argue about whether or not stuff just is. It's my, uh, my example, if you want to run around in a bathing suit in Illinois in January, I mean, you can. It's stupid, but you can. And you can wish it to be 85 and sunny in the middle of January in this state all you want. Guess what? It's just not going to happen. So, you know, you can fight against reality all you want, but reality is undefeated. Now, I... There you go. Now, I point that out to you for one reason. If that is not true, that you are dead to sin and alive to Christ, then you can't do any of this. And I keep hammering that point because this is the thing about Scripture that we have to keep in our minds, is that Paul is writing to... Christians. He is, when he is encouraging holy living, he is encouraging it to Christians. You can't just take pagans and go, all right, live better. They can't. There's no foundation there. You have to always be aware of that as you're reading your Bible because, okay, coming around, all right, we haven't even started on the passage yet. I'm coming around. You know we're in trouble. If you don't remember that, you will become unbalanced in some shape, form, or fashion. If you want to understand how humanity so quickly falls into legalism, it is the demand of righteousness without the reality of transformation. When you sit there and just try to demand that people live differently, live better, follow God, but their hearts have not been changed and their minds renewed, then you are attempting to impose a legalistic system. The reason why I always try to remind you of that is because this is what we do. Like, it's the air that we breathe as humanity is to give me my list of stuff, tell me what's on my list, tell me what's on my list of stuff not to do, and I'm happy. Like, if you had more than one kid, you had one of the kids who was like that. I think God does that as a reminder to you that, like, you have one kid who challenges every rule and one kid who's just like, just tell me what the rules are and everything will be okay. <laughs> See, I was an only child, so I had to waffle back and forth growing up, so <laughs> pick, pick which day I wanted to be. It's fascinating to watch, like, Cameron's family because she's the oldest of four, so Cameron was the rule kid. Just give her the list to do, give her the list not to do, and everything is good and she's happy. It's her sister who's right behind her who's like, eh, those are more like suggestions, right? <laughs> and then her brother after that was like, they're not even suggestions. We don't care. It's like a speed limit in Chicago. Unless you put the speed camera up, nobody cares. Not that you can speed in Chicago because, you know, there's there's a car right there. I mean, where you, that's why I always got to laugh. It's like, what's the point of the speed camera? How could you possibly be going 40 in this area? It's not, it's not even a, a possibility. But anyway, so that's why I forever hammer on this is you can't lose the necessity of saved by grace that Paul was laying out in Romans 3 and Four, when you are dealing with his exposition on the law in 6 and 7. And you can't forget the necessity of, the, of what sin did to you in 1 and 2. How you are saved by grace in 3 and 4 when you get to his exposition on what it means to be Israel in 9 and 10 and 11. Is this all is building and following after itself logically? Because remember, the Roman church would not have done what we're doing. Roman church wouldn't have been like, okay, we've read four sentences today. Of course, that could have been like eight chapters in this book, depending on how Paul's grammar was going that, that afternoon. But it's not, like, it's not like they sat there and, well, we read four sentences. Let's put this down again until next week. They would have done what? They read the whole thing. And then they would have thought about it and uh, tried to apply it and go from there. So don't forget what has come before as you move forward. So because of the reality that you are saved by grace through faith, because that should then have bearing on your life because you have a new reality compared to the old, you are forced to think about things in light of that. If you are not, you have found your idolatry, you have found your sin area, go about the business of killing it, and that is how the reorient reorienting 
of your mind functions. And that is the foundation that you have to have as we dive into this. Sound good? Okay. With that said, let's have some more fun with Paul's exposition on law. Let's start with verse 1, because that's always a good place to start a new chapter. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Well, duh. Like, you can't find me if I'm dead. Don't give the IRS any ideas, okay? As soon as they figure out an idea to make you pay taxes after you're dead, they will do that. So don't give them any ideas. Actually, I probably shouldn't say that in speaking different distance of Cook County because they could probably come up with a way to tax you when you're dead, too. <laughs> so, ooh, there's got to be a grave tax. Someone will pay that. <laughs> That's how they get them to keep voting, isn't it? As long as they can keep taxing you, they can leave you on the, on the voting records. I, I just figured it. <laughs> you laugh. That was my favorite. What, what, remember looking at that, Cameron? What, was that 2012? There was a county in California that had like 115% voter turnout. <laughs> And I'm like, that doesn't work like that. Like, you can't have more people voting than you had registered voters. Like, that's not an accomplishment. <laughs> it's like when you were a kid and you knew the exam was going to be tough in, in school. And you're like, can we have extra credit? <laughs> like, the kid who made the 100 in the exam is never worried about the extra credit. But um, apparently you can do that. But anyway, this is one of those duh points of humanity. Like, you can't get speeding tickets when you're dead. They can't tax you when you're dead. You're not bound by the law because you don't care anymore because you're dead. Now, this is one of those things that should be a duh for the Christian, but there are so many times in life when things that should be a duh for us just aren't, because this is why I joke with you guys, like, when I'll read the trivia question or ask you a question, and then I'll just say, don't overthink it. Because what do we do? Oh, no, pastor's trying to trick us. Let's, okay, but he's got a mean, no, 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 no. That's why I got a good laugh out of Dan, because what was the answer this morning? What did Paul do? desire to know? Jesus. So what did Dan do? Jesus! <laughs> Sometimes the answer is simple, and when it's simple, don't complicate it. Now, are there complicated things that underlie it? Possibly. But start with the easy stuff and move back. So this is the building out. So things like Hebrews 5 are the reminder, because this is some of the stuff that has to happen. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, talking about Jesus, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. This is what you're supposed to be doing on a regular basis, is making sure you keep you are keeping the main thing the main thing. The way you build on advanced concepts is not forgetting what's gone before. Do you remember doing this in math class and when you were a kid? Like you got a new concept in third grade math, you're like, This is impossible, we're never gonna learn this. And then by the time you're about halfway through fourth grade math, you're going, That stuff that we were never gonna learn is stuff that we're just doing every single day. And then you, you got to high school and you missed one concept and then you were behind for the rest of your life. <laughs> like you hit algebra and about halfway through algebra, something left you and you're like, now I'm doomed because the snowball has gone down the hill and I can't catch up to it anymore. You want to do calculus? No, no, I don't want to do calculus. I didn't get the algebra part. What do you think is wrong with you? So, this is Christian living. You got this. Now keep that. Focus on it. This is why I give you the simple things like um, look at yourself and then look at Christ. It's the basic thing. Who are you? I'm a Christian, saved by grace, by the mercies of Christ, by the renewing of my mind. I'm being sanctified day by day. Okay, those are the easy things that we then build out in life. You have to keep that foundation and don't make it complicated. You're dead. The law doesn't apply. This is what Paul was getting on about earlier in chapter 6. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. So you should be able to figure this out from 6 moving into 7, but just in case you can't, just in case I haven't given you enough weird examples, Paul decides it would be a good idea to give you an example that would make sense of this, so that is what verse 2 is all about. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. This is another one of those where you just kind of go, 
Uh huh. It's what he explained earlier to the Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 7. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. So, this is one of those things that Paul has been consistent upon. And I'm going to take a, a quick little exit ramp because uh, we can't help ourselves. You can't give a pastor a, ver a, a, a verse on marriage and not expect us to like take a quick exit ramp. <laughs> It's, it's like dangling red meat in front of the tiger cage. We're like, woo, shiny object. Um, regardless of what the world tells you, regardless of what society tries to lay out, this is the biblical standard. Now, I'm going to point something out to you real quick. Notice the word that I used here. This is the biblical standard. Now, remember that falling into legalism uh, ditch I mentioned earlier? If you look at the standard and go, I have not kept that. You know what I say? Duh. I get that. I'm not going to tell you it's okay. I'm not going to make excuses for you. I'm not going to make any changes for you. I'm going to say what? In this too, you have sinned. For this too, Christ has died. But this is still the biblical standard. Whether or not we violate it or not doesn't change what the biblical standard is. Whether or not you are guilty of violating the standard does not change what the standard is supposed to be as you encounter the world. I mentioned this in Sunday school a thousand times. Um, one of the most dangerous things we say as parents, and every parent at some point has done this to themselves because we all get lazy and we get tired, is we go, well, you know, I did the same thing, so I really can't say anything. <laughs> What's wrong with you, man? No, no, no. You see, you knew it was wrong when you did it. You know it's wrong when they do it. But because you did it, that you think that would make you a hypocrite when you tell them not to do it? That's called wisdom. It's, you know, kid, I stubbed my toe on that thing. You know what you should not do? <laughs> you should not stub your toe on that thing. So those of you that have fallen, those of you that have failed in a certain area, have the best perspective from which to look at the world and say, there be brokenness here. There is still a standard that the grace of God overcomes, that the mercy of Christ covers. And as you lean in Him, His grace and mercy covers you, he binds up our wounds, and he heals us. Now again, does that change the standard? No. Does that make any of our past sin right? No. Does it make us right before God? Yes. Now, the reason why I tell you this is the standard, don't do that. Screen, not cooperating. This is the standard that Jesus lays down. So things like Matthew 19. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And Jesus answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, what I love is, I, I don't have it there, but Jesus gives you the great answer. So why did Moses tell you to give a certificate of divorce? For the hardness of your hearts. Because humanity is broken. Moses made allowance because he is dealing with a sinful people who, wait for it, sinful people are going to do what? Sin. See, we get shocked by this, that sinful people sin, and then they're like, I cannot believe you. I expected so much more. Have you met people? This is the question I'm always, I'm always asking Cameron. This Cameron's like, I can't believe this. What do you mean you can't believe this? Have you met people? Have you, I mean, did you forget? Real quick, since I'm starting to sweat, is it a little warm in here to you guys? Okay. I will keep talking while fixing that problem. So, no, why are we shocked that people are sinning? Why are we shocked that something is going wrong? Because sinners, wait for it, actually sin. You know the camera's going to love this, right? <laughs> Just me going back and forth, la-da-da-da-da. There you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here looking. Some of you are sitting there starting to, to glisten, and I was like, I'm sweating, but I never go by me because I'm always sweating, so... So sinners sin, society breaks down, marriages fall apart, things are broken. Okay, stop. What do we do right now? Look at your life. Look where you are. Cling to the Savior. Run back to the cross. Know there is grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And then do what from this point forward? Seek to honor and serve God by being faithful now. This is all you are capable of doing. You can't go back and undo past sins. You can't go back and fix that problem. You can't even fix their problems, which you can't 
can do is, like Paul, preach Christ and Him crucified so that the standard will be upheld. And when they look at you and go, well, you failed and you messed up, yes! And I found grace and mercy in Christ. And I found forgiveness at the cross. And I found the love of God and the grace to carry forward. And I found forgiveness and righteousness in His kingdom. And you can too! See, this is, I'm not an expert. I don't know how to preach Christ. What's wrong in your life? There you go. There's your starting point. What has Christ covered for you? Where is righteousness overcome sin? Now move forward. And again, I'm not going to tell you that makes everything okay, but this is what the standard is, and you never forget it. Just because you failed it at some point doesn't mean you then go, well, that can't possibly be the standard. That's how the world argues. They take the morality scale, they move it over here and say, yay, congrats, I'm free. No, no, no. We leave it where it is, we lean upon the Savior, and we trust in Him. With all of that said, I'm getting off of my exit ramp and getting back onto the main section, okay? Because none of that was the point of what Paul gave this for, but again, it's red meat for the tiger, can't help ourselves. So, back on the highway, this is one of those simple things. Um, if your husband has passed, then by law, you're not married any longer. That's the point that Paul is making because this is the... Now, there's a second point that we're going to build on apart, but I'm going to remind you of it right now real quick. 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is making a, a, a larger point about about the law in general by making the example here, and we're going to continue with it in verse 3. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. This is another one of those duh passages. That just kind of makes sense. But it's making a point in two directions bigger than that. So... Like, I don't think it's an accident that Paul chooses this analogy for the law, because Paul could have chosen a bunch of stuff. Like, he could have said, like, if you die, we can't arrest you for stealing anymore. But if while you're alive and you've stolen things, you're a thief. Paul could have gone down that road. Why is he picking marriage? Because it's biblical language that God and the New Testament, God in the Old Testament and the disciples in the New Testament readily use as a comparison. And it's a point that can get made in two directions. So, first direction would be things like James 4. James talking to the church. You would Adulteresses, Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. Jesus made a point in a different direction from the same, same idea. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. So, let me, let me distill this out. If you cheat, you are a cheater. If you abandon the faith, you are faithless. If you have tried to keep the biblical standard while not actually following after Christ, what do we call you? So I'm trying to keep a standard that I have no internal desire for, but I just want to be outwardly nice to everybody. What do we call that person? That's a hypocrite. Now, if you are none of these things because you have died to sin and are alive in Christ, you have been renewed from the inside with the changing of your heart and the renewing of your mind, and you are seeking to follow after God, the world then looks at you and calls you what? Now what have you abandoned? Them. This was the danger from Romans 1. This is why the adulteress's language, this is why the, the world will then look at you like a spurned lover. Because you have abandoned them, and your righteousness reminds them of what? Constantly. This is the danger that happens in Romans 1. What do they have? Because they have been darkened, they give hearty approval to everyone who does the same. Well, what happens to those who don't do the same? What if you're not following with me in the desires of my flesh and the lusts of my eyes, and you're actively walking away from those things and highlighting the fact that I am sinning? Now who's the problem? Is my sin the problem? No, my sin is not the problem. You, for pointing it out, are my problem. That's why this language is so important. It... The reason why your Old Testament uses the language of God and Israel as husband and wife, why the New Testament will use the same language, is because it's a baseline relationship for humanity. It is something that we all innately recognize is something that should be set aside from the world. Like there are some... Th 
simple thing, right? There are things about your marriage you don't share with the rest of the world, right? <laughs> it's not like you walk around with a billboard going, hey, this is what happens in my house every week. Not all of you are as weird as me. <laughs> and wait for it. For all the weird stories I tell you, there are things about my marriage I don't share with the world, okay? There are just some things innately that you know are ours. They're not for you. And when you see people sharing the things that are supposed to be for them with the rest of the world, you immediately know what? By nature. There's just, there's just something wrong. There. There's something off going on here. I don't know what it is. I just know I don't like it. Because you know you have a sense of this. And this is where this language is helpful and why it is important. Now, with that said, Paul's going to keep building on the point. So... If while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So here's where the bigger point begins to get laid out. In Christ, because you are dead to sin, you are dead to that first use of the law. More on that in a minute. You are free to do what? Live however you want? No. You are free to follow Christ. You are free to pursue, to pursue righteousness. So, let me use this example. If you're married, lady, do you get to go looking for a new husband? No. What do we call that? Adultery. Now, if your husband has passed, are you free to go looking for a new husband? Yes, you are free to pursue a righteous relationship. That's why Paul, that's why, that's why I didn't leave it off. Where is it? 1 Corinthians 7. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. It's not whoever she wishes, it's whoever she wishes in the Lord. You are not free to do whatever you want. Every time I say that, I get that. Am I the only one that gets that song stuck in the back of your head? Every time I say it like that, you're free. I'm free to do what I want. Any old time. If you didn't, now you do, and you're welcome. And no, I cannot carry a tune even in a bucket. I have to have the music, sorry. So this is the point, this is part of the point that Paul is making. You are free to actually follow after Christ. If you are dead to the law, you are free and alive in Jesus. Hence, Hence the ability to do what is right. So this is where something like Galatians 5 helps us out. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I think the most horrifying part of that list is that there's more. And Paul's just tired of labeling them. He's like, and there's more, but you know, we got no time for that. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. In other words, when you are alive to your sin, you're the first list. But when you are dead to sin and alive in Christ, you are the second list. This is the point that Paul is trying to build out. It is built on the idea that you have actually been changed by the salvation by grace through faith that Paul was laying out in chapters 3 and 4. You get to this middle section, you can never forget that when we get to the stuff coming later, you can never forget how they are in because if you miss that, you will start swerving into ditches. Now again, this is something Paul built up on from Romans 6. Having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if you want to have some fun, you can go digging through the Gospels of Matthew and Luke this week because this is your underlying point of some of Jesus' parables. So, think through something like the parable of the talents. The servants are all given different amounts of money and told to do what with it? Go steward this for the king as he leaves on his journey. He comes back and the one guy doubles the money and the other guy doubles the money and the other guy's like, oh no, no, I buried it in the ground because you're evil and mean and I don't like you and I'm terrified so here's your money back. Well, the two that doubled the money got rewarded and the guy that was terrified and just gave him his money back got punished. Why? Because you view the king as evil and mean. Now stop. What's your corollary in the world? Why aren't you afraid of God coming back? 
Why aren't you afraid of God showing up on Mount Sinai with the thunder and the lightning and the shaking and the quaking and the booming voice and the trumpets and the whole bit? Yeah, because you're one of the kids. Like... Like, if your dad was nine feet tall and walked in the house, and you're one of his children, are you afraid? No. When that guy walks into the kindergarten class, what's the reaction of all the children? <laughs> Don't eat me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a... We, <laughs> we got to see that years ago. My mother-in-law had um, two shizus, and we went over the house with our Newfoundland. And our Newfoundland Axel walked in the house and one of the little shizus just sat by the couch looking like from underneath the end table like this. <laughs> like I'm watching the dog look and like and all my brain is going is Godzilla, Godzilla <laughs> she, she just had this look like don't eat me. <laughs> See, but we're not afraid of the dog. He's our dog. I'm not afraid if my dad's massive because he's my dad. The other kids are terrified, but I'm not. Why? Because I'm one of the kids. Moses isn't terrified to go up the mountain because that's his God. Everyone who is terrified is worried about what's going to happen when he shows up. This is what the fear of the world looks like. This is what the fear of the flesh. So, of course, you're an enemy of God. You know what you should be when God shows up? You should be afraid. The servant who was terrified because God was his enemy should be afraid. Um, parable of the virgins. Half of the virgins did what? They brought their extra oil so that their lamps wouldn't go out. Half of them didn't because they weren't expecting to wait that long. Mm. The bridegroom shows up. The ones that didn't have enough oil were running around looking for oil. Guess what happened when the party started? They were locked out because they didn't value the groom. They didn't value being prepared. They'll just figure it out when it comes along. We've got plenty of time. You've never heard this from one of your pagan friends, right? I got plenty of time to go get some religion. I don't have to worry about that now. We have plenty of time until you don't. And that's one of the warnings of life. This is why I tell you why this is one of this. This is why trials and difficulties and illness and all of these things is you're not built for this world the way that it is now. You're supposed to be built for eternity in Christ. And if you're not, then you're being built for an eternity of judgment. I mean, this is the point of a lot of Jesus' parables and a lot of his work is that you are supposed to actually be alive to something. Not doing whatever, not living according to the pattern of the world, just with nicer language. You are supposed to actually be alive to righteousness because you have been changed from the inside out. And in case we haven't been perfectly clear, Paul is going to beat that dead horse some more and make it even more obvious, because that's what he does. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. We're going to pause right there. You are now dead in Christ to your former master. So again, let's borrow from something like Galatians. If while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is the corollary to John talking about he who has been born of God, he who is redeemed, does not practice sin or does not sin. The reason why he's talking about that is because there's a big difference between being found in sin and being found practicing, reveling, rejoicing in your sin. That's the language here of Galatians 2. If I can destroy what I once built up. Well, Christian, did you build up your place in the kingdom? No. Are you capable of destroying it? No. This is one of those breakdowns that we fail to recognize. This is why I, I jokingly give you that example of the Holy Spirit kind of dragging you along sometimes. You know, my, my joke about the footprints in the sand thing. And if you don't know what that is, I'm not going to tell it again. Um, it's important because self-destructive Christianity is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. 
sinners who are Christians do exist. So your big fancy Latin phrase from last week, simul justus et peccator, right? Simultaneously justified, yet sinning. So even though you are in Christ, you are righteous in his kingdom. Remember our, our threefold thing, you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Until that will be saved part, you're going to struggle with your flesh. You're going to war against your sin. But there's a difference between fighting against it being found to committing occasionally, being found wandering occasionally, and actually rejoicing, being self-destructive, wallowing in your sin. The Holy Spirit will let you go astray for so long, but then we'll do what? Yeah, eventually, eventually mom goes, get your butt over here. Come here. Stop it. <laughs> See, I had one of those parents that didn't let me stray so far, so I would just start to say one thing stupid. All of a sudden, I had that meat hook of a hand for my dad in the back of my neck, and it's like, okay, I didn't see that line, but I have obviously crossed it. Okay. Then you look at your friends like, pray for me. Hopefully, I'll be back later. <laughs> That's what the Holy Spirit eventually, come, stop it. Because, you know, whenever that happened to me as a kid, you know what I didn't do for, like, the next day and a half? Anything. <laughs> Be like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Every once in a while, the discipline of the Lord comes upon you, and you know when it happens, and you do what? message received. Let's actually walk down the middle of the road like we're supposed to be doing and everything will be fine. This is part of not being able to destroy your salvation. It's not that you're perfect. It's that God has not abandoned you. You may be trying on occasion to abandon him, but he has not abandoned you. So I always use Pilgrim's Progress as an example because it's been on my brain for, for some odd reason for months and months and months. But it's one of the parts that was always weird to me, and then it makes sense when you figure it out, is that Christian abandoned the king's highway and takes residence in this castle called Despair and he's just stuck there for what seems like an eternity and he's convinced he's going to die and he's never going to make it to the celestial city and then he realizes you know where the key to his chains are? They're on the lock that he's got. He's had them the whole time. He could have left anytime he wanted. He's like, oh, I'm not actually bound here. Who has bound me here? I did. As soon as I remember that the Holy Spirit has granted me this release, as soon as I remember that Christ has forgiven me, I could have gotten right back on the highway at any point. It's my own stupidity that has left me here. That's your Christian walk. That's one of the reasons why I love the story is John Bunyan just nails all of it. He just he just, he just got it. And it, again, that's why I tell you, get, in, get a copy with the modern English so you don't have to do the V's and the thou's and the ye's and all that good stuff. And it, it'll actually bless you. But that's kind of the point that Paul is making here is that you're supposed to be dead to your former master. So Colossians 1 makes the same point. Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And I keep bringing up these passages because Paul is consistent here. When he describes your relationship to sin, he describes you as what? dead. In Romans, you are dead. In Ephesians, you are dead. In Colossians and Galatians, you are supposed to be dead. And this is like dead, dead. Like um, Monty Python's Norwegian blue. It is, it is expired. It is no more. It has gone away. You know, you are, not, you are not Billy Crystal mostly dead. You are Monty Python dead, dead. And there's two references for all of you movie people. You're welcome. So, you were, ma you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. So dead to your former master, dead to sin, but alive to Christ. And because that is that alive to Christ exists, you are able to now live for God. So I mentioned it last week. I'll read it again this week. Ephesians 2. By grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, because it is God who has killed your sin, killed you to your sin, and made you alive to him for those good works, guess who gets to define those good works? <laughs> it's amazing how that works. 1 Corinthians 2. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except, everybody who's here this morning, what was it? What's the next line? Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom 
wisdom of men, but on the power of God. This is why I forever hammer the idea to you guys. Your good works are simple, everyday living. This is why Paul tells the Corinthians and the Colossian church that you do all things unto the glory of God. It's 1 Corinthians 10, it's Colossians 3. That's, you do laundry unto the glory of God. You sweep the floor unto the glory of God. You go to your job for a paycheck unto the glory of God. These are your offerings. These are your good works. These are the places where the light shines because this is the place where you are. And sometimes it's mundane, sometimes it's exciting, sometimes it's fun, sometimes Sometimes it's miserable, but it is all part of the work that God has given you. Because this is the lot in life that he has created. You find your daily bread, the provision that God has given you in the daily things of life. The lie of the 15 minutes of fame that the internet promises is that if you're not doing these great things, or people don't know who you are, then you're not anything. <laughs> Amazingly, the pagans want you to follow after their pagan standards so that you will abandon what? Godliness. It's almost like nothing has changed from the very beginning. I mean, what, is, what does the serpent say, all right? Did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, he didn't say that. Now, why are you trying to twist what God has said? Get out. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. No, we... We can eat from anything, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day we eat of it, we'll surely die. And then the lie, you won't die. Do you really need to be anonymous all the days of your life? Who said that? Who argued that? No, I need to actually just live my life unto the glory of God and whatever will be, will be, right? Didn't you learn that in elementary school? <laughs> Am I the only one who had a mother singing K, sera, sera? <laughs> Where is that from? Is that that German, the Nazis? Is that, is that from The Sound of Music? That's not? Okay. Which one's that from? Is that Mary Poppins? Okay. See, I don't watch musicals, so I know it's from one of those weird ones that I don't watch. So, hey, there you go. Argue amongst yourselves. <laughs> Sorry. The only thing I know about The Sound of Music is Julie Andrews spins in a field. <laughs> And you're all picturing it right now, right? Because even if, if you're like me and you've actually never seen it, no, I'm not watching it. I don't do musicals. <laughs> all I can picture is the commercial, and it's Julie Andrews. You know, <laughs> I just know there's something about Nazis, and it's like Heidi or something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, and then the lie comes in. Well, 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 if you're not clinging for this, you're not really doing anything. Go away. That should, there's where you get it right where Adam and Eve got it wrong. It's just, go away. <laughs> no, I follow Christ in him crucified. I die to the flesh. I serve God because I am alive in him. And that is where my joy is found. And by the way, to borrow back on the marriage argument, this is how Jesus defines his works in things like Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. This is the goal. What's the goal of all those mundane offerings unto God? The glory of Christ, the building up of his kingdom, the strengthening of his people. There it is. Where does that occur? In daily, everyday discipleship and discipled living. Verse 5. For while we were in the... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. And all God's people said, duh. Because what does sin do? Gee, it corrupts and it destroys and it just degrades everything. So this is why, again, uh, Galatians 5, Paul tells him what? I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Because you don't need it. Because you're led by Christ. And he has accomplished our righteousness, and you are no longer seeking to evaluate your sin. You are seeking to evaluate your life for righteousness. Now, that reminder, though, should always anchor you as to where your battle is supposed to be. So, 2 Corinthians 10. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So where do we war? Ephesians 6. 
be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is why, to go back to my bad joke from earlier. What, you know, what did Solomon do about one baby and two moms? Why does the world say, well, just call one of them dad and it'll be fine? What are we attacking? Because we look at that and go, well, that's just ridiculous. You can't just change reality. Mm, they're not trying to change reality. They're just trying to change the way that you see and talk about reality. Because if I can do that, I can destroy that imago Dei, the image of God that you're made in. If I can get you to think of that as corrupted and get you to think about the natural order that God has made as something that is broken or something that we can alter, I am now changing the foundations of how you think about the world and who you think is at the root of the world. Because if I can get you to think that you're in charge of the world, then who have we said is not in charge of the world? I've, we've basically gotten God out of his chair, and who's now sitting in it? We are. Aren't we special? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> These are, this is the point when we talk about the battle being not against flesh and blood. It's about the foundations. It's about the mindsets. It's about the worldviews. It's about thinking through where the battles are actually being fought. What are they undermining? What are they attacking? And yes, I know I'm asking you to do a lot of thinking, but I've told you before, Christianity is a thinking religion. It requires you to evaluate what you're doing in life and why you're doing it. Because what you're doing is your simple offering in life. It's your simple offering to God. How you go to work, how you talk to your spouse, how you raise your kids, how you argue with the neighbors is all your offering to God. So why are you doing it will determine what the, look, what the doing actually looks like. That's where the foundations are. That's where the argument is held. And by the way, that should always remind you of how the redemption is supposed to be won. Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his grace, great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. A little parenthesis. By grace, you have been saved. And he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So yes, sin corrupts. Yes, it destroys. Yes, it tears down. Yes, it makes a mockery of everything. And yes, the world is lost to it. But... God is the one who covers. God is the one who redeems. God is the one who makes righteous. And that's where the battle is being fought in your daily life and in your daily life out there. Remember that, and you will remember where the foundations are, and you will remember how to evaluate your life and what it is built on. Verse 6. But now we have been released from the law. Remember, we talked about this. That's the first use of the law is no longer needed. You don't need to understand what your sin is and make sure that you are seeing yourself as broken. You've already done that and come to Christ. So, Romans 6, 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. You don't do that because you are dead to sin. So the law is no longer giving you this list of things you need to worry about seeing yourself as sinful. It is giving you what? An explanation of the righteousness of God and how you apply that righteousness in your world. So what's your summary of the law, Christian? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. What was Jesus' command to you? How will they know you are my disciples if you have love for one another? Because, see, why does Jesus give you that standard? Because if you're wallowing in your sin, you can't love people. You can't. They will drive you insane. Have you met people? <laughs> if your world revolves around you, everything that they do will do what? Yes, it'll bother you. You, this, you ever had that argument with somebody? You ever, I mean, they, actually, no. I have this discussion all the time because Cameron and I will always talk about this while driving around. This is where road rage comes from. And I'm not even kidding. Road rage comes from... I was driving, and you cut me off. And in my mind, why did you cut me off? 
because you cut me off. You did that to mess with me. Look at this guy. He keeps speeding up and slowing down. He keeps changing lanes. He's messing with me. No, he's not. You know how I know he's not messing with you? Because 99.9% .9 of humanity can't think beyond themselves. And apart from Christ, the vast, vast majority of them have no ability to do so whatsoever. They didn't see you. That's why they cut you off. They don't even know you're there. That's why they change lanes in front of you. They're, not, they're talking on their phone. That's why they're speeding up and slowing down. You have not entered into this picture at all. But we assume you're messing with me. And then when I start messing with you, you assume that I'm messing with you because wait for it, now I am. And now we're all mad at each other and we hate each other because we were all thinking about who? Ourselves. Ourselves. It's the gospel message that tells you what? Stop thinking about you! It's not about you. It's about Christ and Him crucified and your offering unto Him. There you go. I just solved all the driving problems. <laughs> just get everybody saved and we'll all drive better. <laughs> if only we could pull that off, right? But this is the reality of how you live righteously. This is the brokenness that you're encountering in the world. So now we have been released from the law, having died to that to which we were bound. You're no longer under a curse. Why not? Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that Christ Jesus, in the blessing of Abraham, I'm sorry, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So you have been released from that first use. You have died to that which you were bound so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So why can you live differently? Because you are different. Remember, you have to remember that reality of chapter 4, well, 3, 4, and basically into 5, that you have been saved by grace through faith, and you have been transformed by the work of Christ. Therefore, because you have been transformed, you are actually different. Your reality has changed the way you think, the way you evaluate, and therefore, things like John 8 are about applicable. Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of light. That's the hope. Now, where do you shine that light, Christian? I don't know. Where are you? How do I shine that light? I don't know. What you doing? But I failed. I get that. What do you do next? Look back at Christ. Look back at the cross. Look back at the redemption that has been accomplished. Know the work that has been done. Rejoice in the discipline of the Lord. Work forward. Move on with life and realize that he has carried you through. He will carry you through and he will bring you to a good end. This is why I'm always reminding of, of this in prayer. Where are we going? What is our hope? And how is it accomplished? It's accomplished by the work that Christ has done and the building up and the continuing work that he is still doing day in and day out. You need that reminder. I need that reminder because how easy is it to think that we're doing this? That we got this? Because who do you spend all your time with? Yourself. You! Who do you talk to more than anybody else in the world? Yeah, you, whether you like you or not. And there's the really dirty secret. When you hate you the most is when you deal with you the most. <laughs> so you're always talking to someone you're annoyed with. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong in this scenario? Yeah, run back to Christ. Talk to him. Deal with him. Be reminded of who you are in him so that when you're dealing with you, you're dealing with you rightly and you're actually building up and creating the right foundation. You are building upon what God has made and you are building rightly. This is the joy and this is the work and this is what Paul is trying to build up in this church. So you've seen the brokenness of the world. You have seen the realities that that brokenness affects everybody. It's chapters 1, chapters 2. You have seen what God has done with this in chapters 3, 4, and 5. And now, how do you live in light of all of that history, in light of all of that sinfulness, that is what 6, 7, and 8 is actually building out. And that's where we are. How do you live in light of the realities of who Christ is and what he has done? And the joy of that is, is you live your life, knowing that he is redeemed, knowing that he is redeeming, and knowing that as you work, as you fall, he picks you up, he has cleansed you, and he is cleansing you, and he is bringing you to a place in which you will be cleansed, and therefore you can rejoice. You can rejoice in this failure, you can ensure you can instruct, you can disciple, and you can know that he has not forgotten. Let's pray.